The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the Paranormal View. And welcome everybody right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everybody for being with us tonight, those in the chat room and those listening from around the world. We appreciate each and every one. Um, we got a great show lined up tonight. And if you do have any questions... You can take and private chat them to either H. Foister or Ceiling Cat, and we will get those answered for you. And if you're listening from somewhere else around the world and you do have questions, you can take and send an email to uh, theparanormalview at gmail.com, and we will get those questions and get them answered for you. Uh, let's see. We have uh, tonight, <clears throat> we do have with us tonight barbara duncan i am here yeah <laughs> unfortunately jeff is still not able to be here he is on the east coast tonight uh, with his family so uh wishing him uh, a great time there and hopefully soon he'll be able to be back with us we all do miss him um, but we got a great guest uh tonight and um because there's so much to it and uh I'm not sure exactly how long she's going to be able to be on with us. I'm going to let Barbara go ahead and uh, introduce our guest. Okay, folks. Tonight we have as a guest Marie D. Jones is a returning guest. She's been on the show a lot, and we love her. Um, she is a best-selling author, screenwriter, producer, researcher, public speaker. Um, she is... Optioning a number of her screenplays for her own production company called Where's Lucy Productions, and we could talk about that too. Um, she's also uh, has several uh, film and television properties optioned with Bright Frontier Films and uh, MDR Entertainment. Uh, she's the author of over 15 nonfiction books on cutting edge science, uh, the paranormal, conspiracies, ancient knowledge, and unknown mysteries. Her books include science. Uh, how New Discoveries in Quantum Physics and the New Science May Explain the Existence and Paranormal Phenomena. Uh, 2013, The End of Days, Our New Beginning. Uh, my favorite, Super Volcano. Uh, Destiny versus Choice. Uh, the Scientific and Spiritual Evidence Beyond Fate and Free Will. Another, oh, just, she just writes these wonderful stories. The Grid, uh, Exploring the Inner, um, the Hidden Infrastructure of Reality. The Resonance Key. Uh, oh my goodness, she's asking me. These uh, books are from the future, A Journey Through Portals, Relativity, Wormholes, and Other Adventures in Time Travel, as well as The Deja Vu versus Enigma, um, A Journey Through the Anomalies of the Mind, Memory, and Time. And we can go on and on with 1111 Time Prompt Phenomenon. Uh, you know, it, it's just amazing how many books she writes. Um, her newest are, however, Demons, Devils, and Dark Angels, A History. And the power of archetypes. And tonight, uh, she also has her new book on uh, the uh, haunting stories, ghost hauntings, yeah, celebrity ghosts, and, and notorious yeah. hauntings. Yes. Please welcome to the show Marie D. Jones. Well, hello there. Yeah. <laughs> well, we didn't even get into the fact that you're also a trained disaster response preparedness insert um, through FEMA. Um, you're also a licensed ham radio operator, which I think is just fascinating, you know, and you're also into horses. Do, do you really have time to do all these things? Well, <laughs> I want to see your schedule you know book. The good thing is that, like, with writing, it's really good because, you you know, I get up early. I get to work early. I used to write just constantly, but I'm now really 
um, being a good girl and giving myself evenings off and weekends. I, I usually write one day, um, but I can do it whenever I want. And I've gotten to be so fast at it. And, you know, I have my rhythm down, I guess you could say. So it does, I do have a lot of time to do a lot of other things because of all the books and stuff I've written, I feel like I've kind of trained myself to be able to, like, I don't get writer's block uh, ever. I sit down, I can pump out to several thousand words and, you know, I'm never like stuck or anything. So I'm really lucky in that respect. Wow. But I mean, I wish I had more time to to write more books. <laughs> well, now, um, what is it that you do with the film? Are you just uh, like a producer or uh, do you have you acted in some of the movies? Oh, God, you do not want to see me act. No, you don't want to see me act or sing ever. <laughs> so <laughs> what happened? So when I was young, I actually started writing I wrote fiction, I wrote short stories, and I wanted to be a novelist. And when I got into my 20s, I lived in Los Angeles for a long time, and I got into writing screenplays, and I really enjoyed it. And I, you know, had an agent, and I would go to pitch meetings, and this and that. And not a whole lot came of it, probably, which was a good thing, because I was so young. I probably would have sold my soul to the devil, but... Uh, <laughs> I still was writing fiction. And then later, it was much later that I just kind of got the bug to try nonfiction. And I wrote one book just for fun called Looking for God in All the Wrong Places. And I got it published. I got a publisher. I got my agent, Lisa Hagen, who's still my agent today. This was, gosh, this was a long time ago. And um, it sold maybe five copies, but like I said, it got me my agent. And Lisa got me my first big book deal, and that was for science, P-S-I-E-N-C-E. -E. And from there, it just kind of took off. And I kind of felt like, well, this is really weird because most people will only write in one format. Either they'll just write novels or they just write screenplays or they just write nonfiction and I can do all three. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I started so young and I never really questioned that I couldn't do it. And I've had so much practice with all three. And so a couple of years ago, um, I had have a manager and an agent for my screenplays and all that stuff. And my manager said, you really should start thinking about producing. So she gave me some projects that, you know, are being pitched where I would be attached on as a producer. And then I signed some options on some material that I had where I'm attached to produce. But that's kind of out of my control until they actually sell. So in the meantime, I went and decided I wanted to make some independent films. And I made two short films where I wrote and executive produced and, and co-produced with a couple of other producers. And next year for 2020, I should be doing my first feature film. So it really? just kind of all oh, happened, wow. you know. Congratulations. So how did you move over into the paranormal? Now that, I so when I was really young, I loved telling and writing ghost stories and horror stories. I'm talking, you know, five, six, seven years old. And I was a UFO nut ever since I was really, really young. I was really obsessed with UFOs. And so was my dad. And we had a neighbor that lived across the street who was a total UFO nut. And so, I mean, I grew up, like, we'd go to the library back in those days, and I'd always want to get books on ghosts and UFOs and, I, and Bigfoot, and I just loved all that. And it stuck with me all through my life so that when it got time to write nonfiction, and Lisa and I were deciding, you know, what would I like to try to sell first? Science was the very first thing that we got out there because I loved the idea that maybe 
you know, consciousness and quantum physics and the whole idea of parallel universes and other levels of reality could have something to do with the paranormal. And then from there, I did write some books that are not about the paranormal, but most of them either are directly or kind of indirectly. Like Destiny versus Choice, I don't know if you would call that paranormal, but I do have a lot in that book about different types of divination systems that can predict the future, like astrology and numerology and what have you. So there was always kind of a connection. But that's just um, that's something that I've been really interested in and fascinated by on a personal level. And even now with my fiction and some of the screenplays that I write, there the content is paranormal because it's as a writer I feel like either you write what fascinates you or don't bother doing it because it's really hard work you know you don't want to write about something that you're not really excited and um, fascinated by well I also find it interesting and I'm sure it comes from your father or or inspired by your father and that is your your scientific approach to yes your non your nonfiction <laughs> books, which um, I like because it it doesn't base it on conjecture. You're actually putting fact and data. Yeah, see, books. I'm lucky. So my mom is real creative. She she gave me all the creative stuff, the writing, you know, creativity. And my dad was a geophysicist, and I got my love, you know, from very early on. Again, my love of science from my dad when I was little. I was kind of a tomboy and I had a geology set and, you know, I had a um, animal tracking stuff and I would always read books about science, whether it was astronomy or marine biology. And I, that was such a huge passion for me. But I also was very much aware that there was an unseen side to things. And believe it or not, my dad agreed. And I, I loved that a, a scientist was open about, yeah, there seems to be all of this other stuff going on, but we just don't quite know how to explain it yet. And I always felt like there is a science to the paranormal, but we haven't quite mastered what that is yet. And it's so funny, a lot of people have a hard time with that. Oh, no, no, you know, there's no science to it. Yeah, there is, because science, saying that there's a science to something really just means there's a way that it works. You know, the science of something is describing and explaining the mechanisms behind it and how it works. And I always was really fascinated by that. But I did, you know, I wrote other books like Super Volcano. I wrote with my dad and um, my publisher asked me to write about the 2012 uh, enigma of the end of days mythologies and I really liked writing that book so I was really I've really been fortunate that the publishers that I work with have allowed me to write the paranormal it's a very niche thing to write about but also to branch out and write about other things archetypes you know what have you um, I wrote a, a disaster manual on how to survive disasters i've been really really lucky that you haven't had a disaster or <laughs> i you know i live in southern california <laughs> and yeah we do <laughs> um, i grew up in new york so i grew up with rain blizzards you know that kind of thing yeah but yeah i've lived in southern california for a long time and i've been through major major earthquakes terrifying um major wildfires i've been you know ev evacuated and blah 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 and that kind of drove me to want to get training in because uh, i was a single mom and i wanted to know well shoot if something happened you know what do what do i do what do i do with my son and how do we get out and do this and do that and so um, that that book was really, really fun for me to write because I felt like, oh, now I get to kind of give back to readers all the things that I've learned, which, you know, I think are no matter where you live, there are different big and small disasters and emergencies that we're going to have, you know, 
from a bee sting to a blizzard. It could be something very small that people don't quite know how to deal with, or it could be those big ones that we hear about on the news or that happen to us, tornadoes and flooding. Yeah. And it's really interesting because I know that when we start disaster drills, et cetera, that writers can bring in some really fascinating scenarios that yeah. you might not think about. And, you know, it, it's interesting that you can use that disaster training, but also um, as a background for some, I'm sure, incredible novels or even just how to approach um, a, a, dis a natural disaster. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, it, that's true. I mean, don't you think people have a weird fascination with disaster movies? And, you know, I mean, people oh, yeah. really love them. I, I'm older, I'm a little older, so I remember the Irwin Allen, like the Towering Inferno, and, oh gosh, what was it, the Poseidon Adventure, and all those sure. really cool disaster movies. Oh, yeah. But, you know, it's sort of a way for us to live vicariously, like, to experience something that's really scary. And, but you get to do it on film. But the thing is, is, I mean, they happen all the time in our real world. And I, you know, a long time ago came to the awareness that I have two choices. Either I'm one of those people in a disaster that's helpless and hopeless and is going to cause somebody else trouble, you know, to have to come get me and take care of me. Or I can be proactive and help and you know be part of the solution and especially where i live we have so many disasters between fires and earthquakes and flooding and things like that our first responders are tapped out and they need help so uh and, and i whenever something really bad happens i tend to be one of those people that gets really calm and takes control you know after I panic for like two minutes, <laughs> you know, I have that initial panic, but then I get really calm. <laughs> but I love that. I'm fascinated by it. I actually, you know, I think, oh my gosh, if I wasn't writing and doing all this, I would love to go into some kind of disaster management. And um, I'm actually going to join the Sheriff's Academy, not next year, but the year after and join their uh, search and rescue Academy. Oh. I love search and awesome. rescue. It's a really intensive training. Mm -hmm. So I figure I'll spend all of 2020 getting in good physical shape <laughs> to see if I could actually qualify. If I had to do that, it would take probably longer than that for me. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, they have different, they, they say, yeah, well, there's a lot of desk work that you can do. I'm like, no, I want to get out there I and I want to do yeah. the searches. I did a night search and rescue drill a couple of months ago that... I don't know why I just came back from it thinking, I have to do this. And, you know, people look at me like, are you weird? <laughs> um, but it's just, it, I loved it. It was really like, it's kind of like working with the paranormal in that before we went out into the field to, to look for the clues that had been left for us, we had to go through this whole um, pre-training inside where everybody had to ask questions to get pieces of the puzzle as to who was missing and when they went missing and what they were wearing, et cetera, et cetera. It was almost like forensics. Mm -hmm. And I, and I kind of really liked that. I think par the paranormal has its own sort of forensics to it. Well, yeah. So it's kind of a whodunit. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. We're always looking for clues and what can we piece together and what pieces don't fit and, Unfortunately, you know, in the paranormal field, most of the pieces still seem to be missing, but we're, I think we're getting a little closer. Okay. Have you, uh, have you ever seen a ghost? Oh my gosh. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, honestly, and people go, oh, but you're right about him. Isn't that kind of hypocritical? Or no. no it's not. <laughs> so, um, you know, there's so people the been deal. in into it for years <laughs> and ain't never actually seen one so i have never seen in, tr in terms of seeing an apparition right but i have experienced situations where i have felt the presence i have felt um the energy i have felt something i have been repelled or repulsed from certain locations because 
I later found out somebody was murdered there or there had been mm -hmm. you know, crime committed. And that's happened a lot. And I also have heard my name called. My really? um, father's father, my poppy, who's just so beloved, my beloved poppy, had a really unique nickname for me. And it was, the rest of the family had a different nickname for me. So every now and then, even to this day, I will hear that nickname being called. And it's nothing where you could say, oh, I think I heard, but, it, you know, it was a car honking, whatever. It's, it's just very distinct. Wow. So, um, but I've had situations where I've gone into houses or buildings and maybe gone into a room they wasn't supposed to, felt like I was going to throw up. Or, you know, get very dizzy, get very, um, just a feeling of foreboding. And f I would find out later that something really awful happened there. Now, that's happened quite a bit. So, I, you know, in talking to other people, what I've come to realize is that there are, there seems like some of us were more sensitive to perceiving paranormal phenomenon in different ways. So, for me, it's sensitivity energy sensitivity if you want to call it that feeling the vibes other people see things other people hear things other people smell things um you know i can be in a room with someone like for example i was on, in the queen mary and we were in the pool room and you know there's a whole lot of ghosts that allegedly haunt the queen mary i didn't see nothing <laughs> <laughs> I felt a couple of weird places, especially walking down the long, creepy hallway to my room. I definitely felt like, oh, kind of, this is kind of creepy. But there were people in the group that I was in that were saying, look, there's, it's right there. Look, it's here. And it got me really thinking a lot about um, how much of us, how much we as the observer, how much do we have to do with what manifests you know some of us seem to be really really more adept at seeing things and others have blocks what kind of blocks uh, you know could be anything something physiological well you know that old adage of um the observer becomes part of the experiment and i firmly right. believe that's true in the paranormal <laughs> Yeah, you know, and it's like, well, is it is it psychological? Is it that weird science part of me that just sort of subconsciously blocks things? Because I, I have to tell you guys, I am the biggest chicken, okay? I have to sleep with light on, I, like night really? lights. I cannot sleep in the dark. I'm terrified oh. of the dark. If you tell me there's a ghost, I will run. I'm a big, giant chicken. <laughs> but really, <laughs> except when it comes to UFOs. Now, those, I'm game. Definitely game. You want to see one. But, but when it comes to ghosts, I'm like the first person, you know. Horror movies I have a real hard time with because I, I end up having nightmares. I'm very suggestible, I guess you could say. But at the same time, I wouldn't mind <clears throat> excuse me, seeing a ghost if I were with a large group of people. If I'm alone, forget it. <laughs> right. But if I were with a group of people, I would feel, you know, safer. And, and I really want to see it because I want to see with my own eyes. I want to see how it appears, how it, what it looks like. Is it transparent? Do I feel my hair standing up? Is there static electricity? You know, I want to be able to ask all those questions. And I've never been able to. I've always had to rely on the experiences of other people. Well, so that's very frustrating. <laughs> they 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 say that uh, you know I'm I'm probably the same way, but when I'm going on an investigation, I'm always with someone, and they'll tell you, "Don't get between me and the door." <laughs> oh, good. Okay, so it's not just me. <laughs> I got a question from the chat room already, and it's from uh, Tabby. Um, she wants to know, uh, would you compare your theory of resonance and vibration to that of the stone tape theory? Yeah. Um, so 
The stone tape theory is all about imprinted energy and the idea that if something traumatic or highly emotional happens, say in a house or a cabin or a building, that <clears throat> some type of energy is retained within the building itself. How that relates to, to uh, resonance is the fact that energy, everything is vibrational and everything is uh, a different frequencies. So if you go into that building and you happen to be sensitive, enough, sensitive to the frequency or the vibration of that energy, you're going to experience the imprint. If you're not, you, you might not see it. And it very well could explain why, again, six people could go into a building that has a very, very haunted reputation, especially with imprinted ghosts, which literally are ghosts that act as if they're not aware or that they're being observed. It's almost like a looped behavior. Right. They just do the same thing over and over, like walk across the room, and then they do it again later. Um, so six people could go into that room Four people might say, oh, yeah, there it goes. Yep, there. Yep, I see it. And two people will say, I don't see a dang thing. Yep. And it's not because they're, the other four are lying. I believe that there are physiological and environmental things going on that allow one person to tune into that resonant frequency or allow another person to not tune into it. And um, Larry Flaxman and I, we were so fascinated by this subject that we wrote a book called The Grid. And in The Grid, what we did is we wanted to look at all the possibilities of how our physiology, our bodies, our hormones, our brain chemicals, the, the food that we eat, <clears throat> you know, the pharmaceuticals that we take, could all of this stuff be like some kind of weird, strange brew that aligns with what's going on in the environment, which could be the barometric pressure, you know, the, the actual weather, um, precipitation, uh, electromagnetic anomalies or activity, if solar storms, what have you, to create the perfect scenario, like the perfect storm to manifest paranormal phenomena. And Larry had actually done some experiments with his um, group, his investigative group, where they, they kind of tested that out a little, where they would have large groups of people and they would maybe tell them a, a false story about a location. And, you know, maybe seven out of 15 people would actually experience the false story that they were given. You know, they, they just sort of synced into this energy and maybe they've created it themselves. Or So there's all kinds of really cool, interesting questions that I think we need to be going more in that line of research of looking at resonance, looking at the vibrational frequencies between us and our environment. And when we, boom, get them into sync, we, you know, we get to see things that are still there. We're just not aware of them. And how consciousness has a lot to do with that, too. It's sort of locking your consciousness in, focusing on something that you don't normally see until you have a need to. Wow. And it's interesting, too, how, you know, our brains are wired. And, uh, of course, if you think of linear time, that's probably a human concept. Right. And when you take humans out of the the equation and we start dealing more with AI um, and we start making a little bit more um, uh, interaction with that, how AI is going to perceive reality. Oh, that's kind of creepy to think about. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Speaking of the brain, so one of the things that I wrote about in um, a book called The Power of Archetypes is the RAS, the Reticular Activating System. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Anyway, yeah. the base of our, at the base of our uh, skull, there's a cluster of nerves and it's like a nerve group that helps us focus and helps us filter out unnecessary information so that we can function and go through our day and you know not be so scatterbrained, although it works a lot better for some people than others. 
but basically what what that has to do with the paranormal is that if your RAS if you can somehow get it to start looking for what to focus on you can really shift your perception and an, a, a, an example of that would be all of a sudden you wake up one day and you say I would really love to buy a red little convert uh, Mercedes conver convertible um, and then you go outside and you see them everywhere it's like what the heck I didn't think they were so popular now I don't want one anymore well, you know, they've always been there, but you didn't have a need for your brain, for your filter to focus on that information until you decided you wanted one. Then now you're focused, you're honed in on it, you're going to see it everywhere. So if most of us go about our day-to-day -day business and we're not really looking for ghosts, they could be floating around in front of our faces 24-7. But until we have a need to actually get our RAS to focus in on it, maybe that's why we're not seeing them. And maybe some people are better at focusing that part of the brain than others. So those are the things that I think are, I, I find really fascinating. Well, it is true. And because, you know, you could uh, think one day I need a new pair of sneakers. And then all of a sudden you're starting to see ads. You're starting to see other people's sneakers you're, because that's where your focus is. Um, I assume that's what yeah, advertisers you didn't care do. before. I mean, you know, <clears throat> you didn't care that people were wearing those same sneakers. You probably mm -hmm. looked and saw them a million times and it didn't even register. Right. So it's like, oh my gosh, what are we filtering out? Because, you know, like I said, we need to be filtering in the, oh, I got to get up, I got to make coffee, I got to go to work, I got to get the kids off to school. And so our daily survival and, and the RAS actually was developed as a part of our survival mechanism, the primitive brain, because we needed something that would allow us to focus on where food was, where shelter was, um, where predators were, <laughs> so we could sure. avoid those places. But now it's kind of interesting to think, oh, there's this part of my brain that will filter out or filter in what I ask it to or what I focus on, what I intend, what I think about. I think it has a lot to do with the law of attraction teachings, too. Yeah. So do you think that may be part of the idea as to why children see ghosts more? Because they haven't filtered out or they don't have as many filters. I think that and the fact that they, I think, they operate until about the age of seven. I believe they operate in alpha brain wave state um and also i think it's theta i could be wrong there so not only are they operating in more open and accessible brain wave states because they don't have to hone in on or focus on the same things that we do as adults but they're not being told what to focus on they're very open i think you know their consciousness is evolving and they have not yet here's the big one for all us grown-ups they haven't yet programmed into their subconscious oh this stuff doesn't exist oh that's impossible there's no such thing as ghosts there's no such thing as ufos so their subconscious is still pretty pure <laughs> until probably about you know adolescence but yeah definitely kids are some of the things kids say are shocking um, and they're creepy. Like my son used to say things like, you know, they're here. Mom, I can see them. I hope you're not going to be worried about me if I have to go back with them. I mean, he would say all kinds of weird stuff. He had so many. Now, I had invisible friends when I was little. My kid had a bunch of them. And he would talk to them like they were right there. And I always thought, you know what? Maybe they are. I mean, when I was little, I insisted that mine was. So yeah, kids, sure. they'll talk about other lifetimes. They'll they'll say things that just come out of left field, and it's like, whoa. <laughs> well, I I do believe in uh, the spirits are here, and I do believe that there are a lot of people uh, by chance at a certain circumstance 
uh, we'll see them. Um, I know with this book, um, and it's a really, really good book, and it's so much in it, there's no way in the world we could cover everything. But you cover every kind of situation, topic, and, and um, everything, starting with a lot with uh, Hollywood. Um, you talk about uh, ghosts, where they stayed at, uh, the different hotels uh, where people stayed. Um, I guess the Hollywood Hotel uh, has many. Oh, the Roosevelt the Hotel. Yeah. yeah. And uh, you have stories uh, about Orson Welles, Lon Chaney, George Reeves, Rudolph Valentino, uh, still hot places. And uh, yeah. yeah. One, of the, one of the interesting ones I thought uh, was Pickfair. Mary Pickford. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we would kind of expect the old school actors and actresses of the Hollywood heyday um, to be haunting their their mansions and have been lived in now by a lot of different people. Um, and but it's even interesting to see that a lot of you know more currently pop and rock stars and I think anybody who's really well known, if they die tragically, if they die too young. Um, if they die under very traumatic circumstances, that you can almost bet <laughs> you're going to hear some ghost stories about them. And it, it's it's fascinating stuff. And it's not to say necessarily that their ghost stories are any more important than, you know, your next door neighbor. But celebrity itself is really fascinating in that we all feel like we know celebrities and a lot of times we come to love a celebrity so that when they die, there is a sort of a collective trauma and you will have people reporting like, for example, Elvis or Marilyn, um, Abraham Lincoln, you'll have people reporting their ghosts all over the place, their homes, the, um, fa the fa their favorite restaurants, their grave sites, what have you. And I always thought that was kind of curious. It's like, wow, do ghosts really, on the other side, they really get around. They seem to travel. Uh, Elvis was seen in a number of different places, in Palm Springs, in Las Vegas, in his old RCA studio, in Memphis. So are we seeing his actual ghost? Or are we collectively creating ghosts of Elvis? in the locations that we would expect him to haunt? Hmm. That's a really good question. Yes. And, and I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's kind of like a, a collective tulpa, if nothing else. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I love that idea because, you know, somebody brought up something really funny about Elvis, and I was saying, well, why... Why do so many people see the same ghost, but in different locations? And for all we know, they could be seeing them at the same time, like parallel universes, different timelines, but you're seeing the same person. And this one guy said, well, maybe you're seeing also the ghosts of Elvis impersonators who died because they loved him so much that they embodied him in life. And so in death, they're still, they appear still in their Elvis costumes. I thought, now that is really interesting. I never thought of that. I never thought of that either, but it makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. Well, you. Well, there are, I mean, there's Marilyn Monroe person, impersonators as well. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And Marilyn died under, you know, and it, it appears like Marilyn died under very tragic circumstances, obviously. Elvis died of a drug overdose. Um, you know, Buddy Holly died in a plane crash. And it seems like if a celebrity, well, even if they die peacefully, uh, there will still be people that will report their ghosts, but it seems like it's m much more widespread if there was some kind of tragedy. Uh, related to their death, Michael Jackson, um, uh, Jimi Hendrix, and and uh, Jim Morrison, and so anybody you know who like Abraham Lincoln is a great example of a historical ghost, a celebrity still that died tragically, was assassinated, 
and his ghost is seen all over the White House by so many people, especially people that have stayed in the Lincoln bedroom outside of the White House um, at the theater that he was assassinated at. And so, yeah, you have to wonder, is that the actual ghost or are we creating it? Because another thing that I've always questioned is we we are told a lot of times that ghosts are they refuse to cross over. They don't want to go to the light. They don't want to let go of this world. But then I have to think that after several decades, they have to want peace. They would eventually cross over and then we wouldn't see their ghost anymore. So to me, that kind of indicates that there's a lot more going on than just, oh, we're seeing the essence of a dead person or the spirit of a dead person. They haven't crossed over yet. So I kind of think there's a, just as there are a lot of different kinds of UFO sightings, I think there's a lot of different kinds of ghost sightings. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I was going to ask you if, if you want to filter out things more that, you know, through uh, our own processes here, um, that if somebody reports the sighting of the ghost of Elvis, say, that you would tend to dismiss it more than it's the ghost of the gas station attendant on the corner of a town that you've never been to that yeah. you're seeing. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's a sort of a, a weird dichotomy, I guess is the right word, where more people see ghosts of celebrities but more people shun when you say you saw the ghost of a celebrity, they tell you, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, Hey, make up your mind. But you know, celebrities and they don't have to be movie stars. I mean, when I say celebrity, basically, believe it or not, there are a lot of ghosts of serial killers and I include them in with the word celebrity, just because celebrity is someone who's well known. So if people know you, your face from the news or from the entertainment industry, movies, television shows, music, and you die and your ghost, let's, let's just say, let's go to the bare nuts and bolts explanation for a ghost, that it is your spirit. You don't want to cross over yet. You're not ready to let go of this world. Well, it would make sense that quite a few people would recognize you over that gas station attendant that's only known by the few people you know in his little community so that part of it makes sense but again what's hard to figure out is well how is it that Marilyn is seen at the Hollywood Roosevelt Hotel and then at this home that she owned and then here and then at the grave sites what why is that ghost going to all these different places, do they all then exist on the other side? Or are we seeing what we expect to see That's... if we were to see a ghost? Well, I would expect to see Elvis at Graceland. And so people see Elvis's ghost at Graceland. Mm -hmm. So that's another tough one is are we seeing our own expectations being given form like you said the tulpa or the thought form could be yeah all i know if i see uh ghost charlie manson i'm getting out the sage smudge <laughs> it and the holy water immediately <laughs> that kind of see i don't mind seeing you know mary pickford or Thelma todd or some you know wonderful old actor or actress orson wells that i think i could handle <laughs> i still don't want to be alone but but you know seeing some of the more nefarious characters that have died that people report their ghosts do they still continue that their violence in on the other side are they still dangerous um yeah that's kind of creepy so yeah i'll stick with you know this now, is the nice lucille ball <laughs> you uh you not only talk about those you talk about um, a lot of famous people who has seen ghosts uh, but there's yeah. one who uh, a, a singer uh, he's had uh, records Battle of New Orleans and North to Alaska Johnny Horton and you oh you, yeah you had a I very interesting story okay. about him uh, it's 
I didn't even know who he was. Oh, you did was... Oh, yeah. He was, he was one of my favorites. But Yeah, I had no idea who he was, and I was um, looking, you know, doing the research, and I found his story, and I thought it was just so bizarre because he and Houdini have kind of a similar story in that it involves um, a communication from the dead to the living. So the story of Johnny Horton is that he was killed by a drunk driver, and I'll, I'll have to kind of step back a little bit. Okay, so Johnny Horton, for those of you that don't know, country music legend, he himself had an interest in ghosts in the spirit world. He met with a medium all the time, Bernard Ricks, and according to one of his biographies, he had a secret code that he made with a good friend of his, Merle Kilgore, another great singer-songwriter. So when he died, he was going to send Merle some kind of communication that he would recognize. So one week later, he was killed by a drunk driver. He was on his way to a show in Texas. And it was quite a while after that that Merle Kilgore was actually on a, a radio show with Bob Lockwood, who is a famous radio announcer. He introduced him on the air. He played Ring of Fire, which Kilgore had written for Johnny Cash. During the song, a woman called into the radio show, and she said that she was part of a group of psychics that had been together at a sort of a seance the night before, and they had gotten the name Merle Kilgore on their Ouija board. Okay? Well, apparently there was a message that came along with it. And the message to Merle was, the drummer is a rummer and he can't hold the beat. And immediately, Merle Kilgore just was shell-shocked because that was the secret code that Johnny Horton said he would, you know, he would know that it was from him. So, kind of creepy. And Houdini had a similar situation where he left a, a communication for his wife. So... Here's the thing. So I was always hoping that when my dad passed away, <clears throat> excuse me, because he was a scientist, that he would find a way, you know, dad, find a way, find a way for, to communicate with me so I will know, you know. And I never got anything, nothing. Um, and that always kind of freaked me out because my dad, of all people, would have wanted to like figure out, okay, I'm going to do this <laughs> and she's going to know for sure it's me. So, you know, it makes you wonder again, is it me? Do I physiologically block things or am I, am I not a sensitive enough person in terms of what I feel and what I perceive? Like we hear about mediums and psychics and sensitives and that word speaks volumes well, because there are people who are sensitive to this stuff much more than others. It's just like he didn't get the message from Johnny. Johnny sent the message to those who could receive it to pass it on to him. Yes, yes. And what timing, huh, when he's, you know, yeah. the night before he's on a, a radio show. And it was years later. So you, you wonder, like, wow, did it take him that long to get through? <laughs> but it's just, it's creepy. Now you got that kind of, but you know, I, I then, but then you wonder why doesn't that happen to everybody? Why doesn't everybody get a message from? Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people who, you know, their mother died or their grandmother, and they saw the apparition at the foot of their bed the night they died, or they got some kind of communication, or the next day they smelled the perfume that their mother wore, and then you wonder why it doesn't happen to other people. It's got to be something about. The peop the us, you know, our ourselves, our bodies, our consciousness. You're just, you're just not what open we're sensitive to, to. That's like I can be on investigations with uh, I don't know, two or three different mediums and they're sitting there saying, you know, all these people are there, you know, and they're communicating with them and I'm just sitting there looking like, Well, do they really see something or are they just pulling our leg or what, you know, and I, I can't get confirmation. I just have to go with what they're telling me uh, yeah yeah and i i'm such a skeptic too and i i'm not the most trusting person in the world and i would often ask that same question 
are these people just all making it up because they want the attention of, oh, you saw the ghost? Oh, my God, you know, whoa, 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 whoa. But then there have been a lot of experiments that I know that paranormal groups have done where they've had people see things, but they don't talk to each other. They write down what they saw, and then they can corroborate, you know, the stories so that they're not, nobody's tainting the perception of the person next to them. Right. Um, and what's really interesting is also in situations where they're, I know it's not super ethical, but unfortunately it, it's a necessity, I think, for the research situations where people are told a, a false story about a building or a location. And then to have so many of them actually claim to have experienced things that have to do with that false story. Uh, you know, is the power of suggestion something that we need to think about researching more? Because it seems to be very strong. And again, I don't want to say these people are making stuff up. They may have suggested themselves into actually seeing what they saw. Well, here's another thought. Um, just like we all have talents on, on this side of the veil, so to speak. You know, some people are great musicians, some people are great basketball players, etc. Is it a talent, maybe, on the other side, to be able to manifest and communicate with the living? I, I think maybe on both sides, and I've always kind of felt that too, you know. We can all sing, but we can't all sing well. <laughs> and I think sure. if... if some people have the ability to perceive the paranormal or even psychic abilities. That means we all do because generally we all have the same body parts and brain parts and, <clears throat> excuse me, um, brain chemicals and what have you. But maybe it's the quantity or the ratio of, you know, this hormone to that. Little tweaks that make us just a little bit different from the person standing next to us so that they're a much better singer than we are. Um, and, and it is a gift. I absolutely think it is. It's not a gift everybody has, but possibly it's a gift that everybody could uh, strengthen if they wanted to, you know, maybe practice. Or maybe you have to be born with it. Yeah. It's hard to say. I mean, I, I, it's difficult to... I mean, there are enhancements, too. Some people are born with bad eyesight, and we give them glasses. Right. Um, and, and maybe there are ways to augment uh, that communication factor as well. You know, certainly those people in the early parapsychology days, you know, the altered states of consciousness experimented with things along those lines. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I think, you know, people that call themselves psychics and mediums, they're the gifted ones. And they're usually the first ones that'll say, well, you have the same gift. It's just, you know, a little more dormant in, in most people. Like, we're not all good at math. We're all capable of doing math, but we're not all really good at it. Yeah, I found out I don't have enough toes. <laughs> I was like, what? Oh, now I get it. <laughs> yep. I have to use a calculator. <laughs> so when you're writing books on the hauntings, especially notorious characters, um, do you think that the type of haunting, say, between uh, sightings of a celebrity uh, versus the sighting of, say, mass murder serial killers, the types of hauntings are different? Or are people just reporting seeing the presence of them? I think when it comes to the feeling behind that people get, the vibe, if you will, um, I think that there is a big difference between seeing the ghost of Elvis, which would probably make you feel excited and maybe happy, and seeing the ghost of a serial killer, which, you know, a lot of people will, would report feeling a repulsion, um, a, a negative almost foreboding sense of like evil or negative energy. You know, it's energy that we're dealing with. So some of those experiences are going to be more positive than others. 
and seeing a celebrity that, that you loved to me would be more positive and seeing somebody like Manson <laughs> would be very repulsive. Yeah. Get out the station. Yeah. Yeah. But is it, um, are you reporting um, only those people who actually saw um, apparitions or the feelings as well? Um, so most of these are cases where people see the apparition because to me, I think like when you're dealing with a celebrity, if you just get a feeling that something's there, you really can't identify it as the celebrity. It could be anybody, it could be their butler. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, for known entities, for known celebrities or historical figures, the, definitely the uh, apparition or some, you know, a ghost that's somehow identifiable is it, the mainly what I include in here. But then in the rest of the book, there's, you know, stories of haunted locations where people have everything from apparitions to strong feeling, negative feelings to literally being pushed away to um urban legends, you know, cryptids, what have you. So that just sort of runs the whole range of things. But the celebrity ghost is always going to be identifiable. Uh, isn't it the audio as well? Um, the Roosevelt Hotel, um, there's a haunting mm -hmm. of people supposedly hearing trumpet playing. Trumpet playing. Or saxophone, um, I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> which one is it? I think it's saxophone. Saxophone. Um, yeah, well, auditory, so, you know, we have EVP, which is electronic voice phenomena, and that's one of the ways that we sort of pick up on auditory ghosts. Um, uh, people sometimes will be walking through a building, they'll hear a name or their name, or they'll hear talking, laughing, singing, music playing. I love in the, the movie The Shining because that is uh, something that I've read a lot in a lot of different reports where people in some of the old hotels that are alleged to be haunted in the ballrooms, they'll hear music playing. And there's nobody there. They'll hear laughing and glasses tinkering like people are having a party. And they open, you know, there's nobody there. So it's like not only is visual, can a visual apparition be imprinted on a location, but sound, smells, smells. People smell something cooking in the kitchen of, of a hotel or a haunted restaurant. There's nobody there. So nobody's cooking anything but they smell maybe a signature meal that um, the chef that died might have made. People that report, you know, their grandmother made them cinnamon spice cookies when they were little. And sometimes just out of nowhere, they'll smell the strong odor of cinnamon spice cookies. And there's nobody's making any cookies. So a, a lot of our senses can be engaged in and even touch feeling a, a scarf sort of running across your skin or a soft touch. Some people are scratched. It's not always nice. So our, um, all of our senses are engaging in this phenomenon too. <clears throat> now, um, you're kind of talking a lot. We'll kind of slow it down a little bit and we'll talk some so you can rest a little bit there. Yeah, yeah, my voice is, is starting to fade here. Uh, I marked a place on here when you was talking a minute ago. You'd said something about uh, Charles Manson, and there was another voice that came over. I even heard it, and somebody already sent me a message saying that there was another voice that came over. <clears throat> and it was real quick. Don't know what was said. I'll have to check it when I go back and... Uh, look at uh, the tape and everything huh. uh, as a recording but something did come over so we'll find yeah. out what it was and so uh, everybody get out the smudge stick and holy water <laughs> <laughs> no uh, kidding right <laughs> now this book and I, I'm again really like it um, it is chock filled with all kinds of Places, um, hotels, you name it, trains, ships, 
uh, lighthouses, uh, anything you can think of um, where some place might be haunted or there might be spirits. And she has got stuff in here in this book all over the place about it. Uh, I thought it was really fascinating. And, and you also have stories of uh, different different people. Um, Lady Gaga, Sting, Hillary Clinton, Cano Reeves, and Dan Aykroyd all have seen ghosts. So yeah. you've got all that in the book. Um, you've got homes that are in the book. Um, you got one that I kind of like where um, Ozzy and Harriet's home is haunted. Uh, well, you know, there. I mean, a lot of the celebrities would buy the homes of other celebrities that had passed on. And they came with their, they came equipped with ghosts. And even today, you know, Miley Cyrus and, and people like that, Demi Lovato, they're buying these big mansions in Hollywood and old Hollywood and LA that were previously owned by three, four, five owners, some of which, you know, were famous old time movie stars who had passed on. So you kind of figure they're gonna see something. It's a lot different than, you know, buying a, a new home that was just built that nobody died in, unless you buy it and it's sitting on top of a Indian burial ground. Then right. you're in a little bit of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> there ain't enough sage, huh? <laughs> I'm half joking there, you know. Now, you talk also about um, haunted houses and, and hotels. Uh, yeah. There is, I mean, uh, a ton of stuff in this book and you won't sit down and read it in one night so but it is very interesting um, and i had to leave out quite a bit um honestly i think there could be several volumes because i really seriously had to leave so much out and then also people that bought the book they would let me they'd email me or message me and say oh you have you haven't you heard of this place I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, that could go in the next one. So there's a lot more than this out there. There's a lot of haunted places out there. Oh, yeah, Marie, if you haven't already researched the Brookdale Lodge, um, that's in um, San Jose, California. You really should. Yeah. Because uh, that's a place where that not only mobsters hung out, but Marilyn Monroe, Frank Sinatra, um, the Hollywood crowd would come up to get away, so to speak. Yeah, there was another place that Frank Sinatra owned, um, and of course the name just drew a blank, um, in, I think it was outside of Palm Springs, where there was a lot of mob activity that had occurred, and <clears throat> the, it just, I had, you know, sadly had to pick and choose what I could include with the uh, page limitations that I had, and everybody that I talked to gives me five, six, seven more stories of places that they know of. Um, and, you know, even urban legends in their town that are fascinating. And there could be a whole book just on that part, on the urban legends. Yeah, there's there's been a couple places that I've investigated that was really, really haunted. And unfortunately... Um, I was only one of them. I did maybe three or four times, and then the people stopped having us come. And one place I did only one time, and a uh, situation happened where the people who was living there no longer lived there, and the uh, person who really owned the house sold it. So I haven't been able to go back there. But both of those were, were really, really active. And uh, you talk about haunted houses and hotels uh, there's one in Lebanon which is uh, I don't know 25 miles from me maybe maybe a little bit further but not much it's called the Golden Lamb Inn which is the oldest um, hotel restaurant that's still in operation today it was a stagecoach stop um, oh that's that's got a lot of history <laughs> yes yes and um, the way they have it fixed, and I, I think there's been about nine presidents that stayed in that hotel, and all kinds of other 
famous people. And when you go up to the rooms, <laughs> when you go up to the rooms, they'll have a plaque beside the room listing who stayed in that particular room. And if uh, if there's no people staying in that room, the door will be open with a rope across it, so you can actually see inside the room. But uh-huh. uh, but if the door is shut, that means somebody's in there, and you can't you can't see it. Yeah, yeah. Well, there was uh, I think it was on the second or third floor. Um, all the way at the end of the hall, the door was open, and it was President Taft's room that he stayed in. Then there wasn't anybody around, and I had my recorder, and I just asked President Taft, are you here? In a few seconds, you get a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and- you know, it makes you wonder, is every old historical building or is every abandoned hospital or asylum haunted are there some that just plain aren't well and it seems like they're all they all have a story to tell but also like i try to avoid houses because to me haunted houses have been written about you know there's not a whole lot new i could add to that and um, usually with haunted houses, it's a past owner or somebody that was killed there. But these other locations where you might have multiple ghosts and a lot of death has occurred in prisons and asylums, battlefields, what have you. But then there's other ones that you never hear about. You never hear a word about certain battlefields or historical sites that, you know, I've never heard a report on. But then there are others that are like hotbeds of activity. So that's kind of a curious thing, too. Well, I, I think that a lot of the places that you haven't probably heard too much of is people that's actually went there to investigate hasn't said anything. Um, and probably a lot of those places are closed, so you can't go out on the battlefield at night. Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, things like that. Um, and yeah, some of these hotel, a lot of these hotels, a lot of these haunted places have tours. Right. You know, it's like they want to encourage you to, to come and have an experience. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Well, now, you had one uh, one place. It was called the House of Moving Mannequins. I'd never oh, heard of this dear. place, but the story behind it is, is really interesting. Okay, I'm going to have to find it because I have so much in here that I forgot <laughs> what I wrote about <laughs> Uh, I'll see if I can help you find it here. I'm... Yeah, it seems to be that mannequins and dolls seem to be the the creepiest, the, have oh, really yeah. high the creep factor. Yeah, yeah I, this one I think uh, now I'm remembering that um, there were mannequins out on the front porch that were always sort of in a, a different position. I'm, I'm vaguely remembering it. And that's one of the problems of writing a book like this is that it's like, oh my God, that happened? Um, so yeah, if you find it, let me know and I'll, I'll read it. But yeah, I remember that part of it. I hate dolls. I hate puppets. I hate mannequins. I hate ventriloquist dummies. I hate clowns. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, you know, any haunted location that involves a doll or something is really sick. But I think in this case that you're talking about, the neighbors and the residents of the area thought that it was just some strange person who was moving the heads around and kind of putting them in different positions. And There's a place here where I live. It's to the east of me um, in a very small town. There's a road where there's a fence, and all along the fence, some crazy woman, this as legend has it, urban legend, has tied doll parts, doll heads, doll bodies for just like a big stretch of the road, and nobody really knows why. So it's, there's a big urban legend that's been created around that, too. She could just be nuts, but... <laughs> Well, that's possible. <laughs> well, and I think with the you know with ghosts, they're pretty cut and dry. What I love about the urban legends is that urban legends often involve ghosts like the lady in white that are seen 
all over the world and they have a different name in every country or every region of the world but the story behind that ghost is very similar and that she's walking along the road maybe even hitchhiking and then when the car approaches she vanishes or she's walking along a waterway like a lake or a, a creek crying and so you hear that the lady in white you hear that legend everywhere and we have one here where i live in san diego in an area called the elfin forest and i actually drove out there <laughs> many many moons ago when i had first come to to san diego alone like an idiot and i had the creepiest encounter where i was it was perfectly dry and sunny out i was driving through the woods at the time it was a dirt road now today it's built up with a lot of houses but my car suddenly just stalled out and it started pouring and it was raining so hard that the road in front of me was flooding i couldn't get my car to to move the wheels were spinning i was like stuck in the mud pouring and i have this awful foreboding feeling that something is coming towards me and I'm thinking it must be the lady in white. Oh my God, I need to get out of here. I don't think she's very nice. Something bad's going to happen. So finally, don't ask me how, but I got my car turned around, hightailed it out of there. And as I pulled out of the woods, realized it's perfectly sunny and there isn't a cloud in the sky. And my car is the only wet car on the road. So that, and that legend, that lady of white here is persisted over decades. This was a few decades ago that people still claim that they see her roaming through that part of the, the uh, elfin forest. Sometimes she's weeping. There's something, you know, the lady in white urban legends, either she lost a child, uh, her lover jilted her or died, you know, something tragic, but just fascinating that they see the, they see the lady in white in different countries too. Uh, that's kind of like one of the, uh, types of stories there's always a lady in white or a lady in blue or black or yeah different uh, different things and a lot of times the clothing is the same all over the world it's like you know some kind of a gossamer white gown it's it's um you know it's not like oh in one place she's wearing jeans and a t-shirt it's always a very specific type of clothing so uh, I want to ask again if anybody uh, listening tonight has any questions, uh, feel free to private chat them to either H. Foister or Ceiling, Ceiling Cat, and uh, we will get those answered. And if you're listening from somewhere around the world and have a question, you can send an a email to uh, theparanormalview at gmail.com. And uh, Barbara? You got question? Question? Oh, question. I, I know you a lot of them. And that is, you know, <laughs> the whole idea of dolls, um, uh. and, you know, that could be a whole book in itself. I think is, um, it, it's interesting. In Reiki, um, you taught that you have to cleanse if you're u using a teddy bear or a doll as a remote healing tool. That you have to cleanse it every now and then because. Um, spirits might become attached to it because you're pouring energy, you're focusing attention on the doll, then it becomes um, a likable source. Right. That right. spirit is, is doing that. It kind of makes you wonder with these people that have doll collections, Ugh. if they're doting <laughs> over them, you know, and just how many of the little critters are actually haunted. Well, and also that kind of goes back to the imprint, um, the imprint energy. So if a doll, <clears throat> excuse me, is owned by someone who loves a doll, it could be a child who dies tragically. Does the spirit of the child, you know, sort of imprint itself on what remains behind a favorite doll, a favorite toy? And, you know, you'll hear about even pieces of furniture that people had Michael Jackson apparently owned a haunted cabinet that was owned by Liberace that he claimed embodied the ghost of Liberace. 
So, you know, I guess <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be a doll. It can be an armoire oh, or true. a cabinet. <laughs> It kind of makes you wonder if J.K. Rowling had it right with the Horcrux thing, in that you know you can imprint part of yourself onto a different objects, and it kind yeah. of makes you wonder things like Robert the Doll, for example, uh, whether he's kind of the Horcrux of uh, Eugene, um, who was the owner. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, because I mean, I you know, it'd be hard to imagine an inanimate object taking on a persona or you know it, it it seems to me that it always is going to be an imprint uh left you know residual energy left behind from one of the owners like yeah. the resonance theory that you were talking about with homes yeah i mean i just don't see uh, an inanimate object being able to sort of manifest that kind of behavior it, it has to, it seems to me, it would have to come from somewhere else. And, you know, dolls, while the Annabelle, and I, I know there's a number of different haunted doll stories, but it seems to me that there was always a very distinct story behind each one and how the owner or someone involved with the doll died tragically or there were, you know, murders that happened around the doll or what have you. I don't know. Maybe inanimate objects can turn on us. Now that would really be creepy. <laughs> I don't know if I even want to think about that. Uh, but, I know one. They had a movie about it. Some little, I don't know, foreign type doll, island type doll who had a little sword kind of thing or big uh, knife. With Karen Black. Yeah, there with was Karen a Black. Of terror. That come yeah. to life. <laughs> I remember that, and 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 uh, you know Stephen King had a, a movie where a, a car, and then he had another one with a truck, came to life and tried to kill people. So I could be oh, wrong. Yeah. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you're absolutely right that, and I wonder if um, the mindset of the people involved with tragedy. Um, sailors who are drowned at sea, for example, or prisoners who uh, were in the electric chair or died in prison, because there is that folklore, if you die at sea, your, your spirit stays at sea. Um, if you die in prison, your spirit stays there. Uh, or even minors, for example, whether um, they feel that they're doomed to be there. Well, and that's another thing. So if you die at sea, you, your spirit stays at sea. But how? why is it that, like going back to the ghost of Elvis or Marilyn Monroe, that on land, their ghosts are seen all different parts of the country, in the studio in Memphis or in Nashville, back at, you know, Burger King in Hollywood or whatever. So... I think maybe the imprinted energy, the imprint ghosts, that I think would apply to. The more sentient ghosts, they seem like they can move around, get around, they can go where they want. But that brings up another question. Why would you choose to hang out in places that hurt you, negative places? If I died, I would want to go to places that make me feel good. Mm -hmm. I'd want to be around people that, you know, my son, I want to see how he's doing. Um, and also, why are so many ghosts seen in cemeteries and graveyards? That's right. not where they died. Right. Are they just unable to let go of their bodies? Is there something going on with that? And what happens if they're cremated? Do we still see them, you know, floating around where all the mm -hmm. ashes are spread? Hmm. I, but I then that would, you know, from that conjecture, <laughs> Disneyland Universal Studios would be really, really haunted. Yeah. <laughs> I think that um, some who maybe died tragically in a certain place, they might be attached to that stigma, and they they either 
don't know they're dead or they don't know that they can move on. And it's like a, a tape redo. They probably don't even notice anybody else who's living that right. comes around. Right. They're not aware. They're more of the imprint right. where they have no idea that they're being observed and they just are kind of going through their motions over and over again. Right. Yeah. And, you know, because, again, where do, where do a lot of people die? Well, they die in hospitals. But the only haunted hospitals that I ever really come across are the ones that are abandoned. So... You know, maybe I'm the probably could be a whole book on people that work in hospitals that see ghosts because that's where you would think that you would see them the moment that they slip from life to death and you know, the monitor stop beeping. Why I and, and I could be dead wrong on this, I'm just not aware of them, but I would think that you would have a lot of reports from nurses and doctors and hospital orderlies and staff. <laughs> that hospitals are just crawling with activity. But I don't think I've heard very much about that. I always, you always hear about hospitals like Linda Vista Hospital here in Southern California that are abandoned. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Because... Yeah, it's true. And you don't see them in the morgues and you don't see them. Um, yeah. I, yeah. uh, I I go to cemeteries all the no time. Way. And take photos. Yeah. <laughs> well, I take cemetery photos all the time, and I have yet to catch anything. Really, really, nothing. Not even an orb. There's so many people that insist that those are really the hotbeds of activity, and that's always kind of bothered me, because cemeteries, they're hauntingly beautiful places, but they're also you know, they're very sad. If I were a ghost, a spirit, and I had the ability to move, I wasn't in an imprint if I were sentient in some way, I would not be there. You know, you know there, there was a time when cemeteries were areas where you would go to have a picnic, and you would have a picnic around the grave, and it was more of a gathering area for right. people. So at one time, they were more um, areas of, of joy, not always just sorrow. I think pop culture has had a lot to do with how we view all of this, too. You know, movies and horror movies oh, yeah. and haunted house movies. and Because I know in other cultures, death is treated so much differently. And, you know, communicating with the other side is just, it's almost such a natural thing. They don't even think twice about it. Yeah. Pop culture. Your next book should be on Ouija boards and why a piece of board could... Uh be a portal to you know, <laughs> I had one as a kid we had the was it the um, Hasbro not Hasbro Parker the Brothers Parker, Brothers. Parker yeah. Brothers okay so my sister my brother and I we had one and we used to play with that thing all the time we even had this light up owl that we would put in the middle of the room and our, our friends would come over and we would do seances <laughs> then we'd go in the bathroom and do the Bloody Mary thing in the mirror. And nothing ever happened. I feel like I feel like now I must have been provoking the demons and they just didn't want to deal with me. I don't know. But you know, we played those were board it was like a board game. Oh yeah. It was like Monopoly. But again, you know, Hollywood, you know. Because I know when Parker Brothers made the Ouija board, it really was meant to be a parlor game. Um, and it was only later yeah. that, you know, somebody came up with the brilliant idea of trying to reach their dead Uncle Joe. And and then the reputation just grew from there. It, it's amazing just how, again, pop culture picks up on that. And it's only been the last couple of years... <laughs> where you get these um, uh, demonic entities, what I think it's called Zozo or something like that. I can't remember. And, uh, you know, demonic activity associated with the Ouija board, et cetera. When before it used to be just um, uh, a dating thing. I mean, I remember seeing in the, in the newspapers from the 60s, you know, they would have it on the lap between a, a, a date 
and, and that's what you would do for fun. Yeah. 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 It's definitely gotten a bad reputation. <laughs> But it's also helped Parker Brothers sell an awful lot of Ouija boards, so you have to wonder if they didn't instigate that somehow. Some of it, yes, makes you kind of wonder. A good publicity stunt that kind of got out of control. Yeah, yeah. I've yet to find a um, a haunted uh, voice recorder that used on an investigation. You've never had EVP? Well, not that then it doesn't haunt the recorder afterwards. Oh, I see what you're saying. <laughs> oh, yeah. I never thought of that. I never thought of that. Yeah. It's like a, it, it speaks through it once and then it's gone. But the Ouija board was, would suggest that that is a vessel or channel it's sort of imprinted upon. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Have you ever had EVP that you felt was like really convincing? Yeah. And that would have been from the um, the uh, USS Hornet. Really? And uh, in the birthing section, uh, we were in there and I had the recorder going <clears throat> and it uh, it was just trying to see if there was anybody around there. Nothing on film. Uh, like I said, I yet to catch anything with a camera. Uh, but you could very distinctly hear a voice say, can you hear me? Oh, my gosh. So it, it was very obvious um, that something was there. Yeah. Um, and that was not in, it was in the birthing section, not in the surgery area or anything along those lines. So it was just where people were normally there to sleep. Huh, that's interesting. I've heard a few names or one or two words um you know never like a full sentence but i've also heard a lot i've also you know been present for some evp sessions where people said oh did you hear that did you hear it and i didn't hear anything and i also noticed that what they would do is that they would say it said da 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 then somebody else would say oh yeah yeah it did and i always felt like that was like kind of leading the witness in a way because, you know, it's like we look for patterns. Our brains love patterns. So if somebody says, well, oh, I heard, did you hear, da, 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 we're going to latch on to that. But when nobody said anything and you heard something to me that, you know, that felt like, oh, it's a little more convincing to me. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, if you like a photograph uh, or an EVP, if you have to um, circle it, uh, yeah. Or if you have to tell somebody what it says, then it's, it's not, not up <laughs> yeah. Yes, I, I believe. And I've seen a lot of that. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I've, I've seen a lot of the red circles around things. Around just blackness. I had somebody insist that they had captured a ghost on their cell phone, and it was just a black screen. And they're saying, <laughs> no, it's there. <laughs> And I so I'm sorry. I, I'm not seeing it. Maybe it's just me. Oh. Well, and that's kind of the the problem with technology that is so readily available. Um, you know, anybody can pick up a high definition camera now, um, and anyone can drag out their cell phone with a camera on it and start taking photos. But if you don't understand photography, uh, you're liable to get things <clears throat> like just simply artifacts that really are nothing um and you know for some of us who take pictures it's like do over time yeah um, but they insist that it's demonic or it's ghost activity when it really isn't well and you think too with everybody having a camera that we w- would be getting much higher quality um photos and videos not just of ghostly activity but ufos cryptids what have you and it still doesn't seem like we're quite doing that I mean, we, I think we get a little more, but we also get a lot of people just photographing anything that they think could be something. And they're not looking at the scientific explanations or the common sense explanations that, you know, they're automatically just labeling it as a ghost or what have you. And so we, it's like we have more ability now to get things on camera, but now we have to weed through so much more junk to find the good stuff. 
Okay, I think what we'll do is <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. Let uh, Marie rest. When we come back, if you're still feeling bad and you want to go, that's fine. Uh, but we'll let you rest for a minute, and we'll go ahead and take a, a quick little break. Um, I mean, it's a great show. Everybody's just loving it. So um, I guess I'll let Barbara take us out on break. And remember, you won't hear anything. Uh, while okay. on break, but your mic will be live, so don't say anything. Uh -oh. I'll mute it. I better not say anything bad. <laughs> <laughs> All mute right, it. Barbara. <laughs> or let the ghost talk. <laughs> Everybody, yeah, you're that's... listening to the parent. <laughs> yeah. You're listening to the Paranormal View here on the Para-X Radio Network. We want to thank everybody for joining us tonight with our very special guest, Marie D. Jones. And we will be right back after a few messages. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Parex Radio Network. I want to thank everybody for being here with us tonight, those in the chat room and those listening from around the world. <clears throat> and uh, Barbara, I don't think that uh, we uh, took a look at where we have listeners at tonight. Uh, tonight they're in the United States, the United Kingdom, Ireland, and our little unknown friend is back. All right. I like our little unknown friend. Keeps us guessing. <laughs> uh, tonight, I want to welcome back uh, <clears throat> Marie D. Jones. Excuse me. Had a little frog in my throat. And uh, we're going to see how she's feeling. Uh, I know she's been sick, and I want to thank her for the time that she has allotted to us. So are you with us, Marie? I am here, but I will say I think my voice is on the verge of collapse. <laughs> okay. Well, we understand. So we probably should wrap it up. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Uh, but but we, I will definitely come back and we can do another round. That, that sound, that's always good to have you come back. So Yeah, uh, there's plenty more that we can definitely talk about. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, definitely. And like I said, I, I do thank you for what time you were on. It kind of slipped oh, away from so me and went further than what we thought. So, um but uh, do appreciate it. And as soon as we get this show posted, we'll send you links to it and everything. Thank so. you. And I absolutely would love to come back and we can get into some of the more um, unusual hauntings and things yeah. when I have when I have more voice to work with. Sounds, <laughs> sounds like a winner. I uh, want to thank you again. Um, so you, oh, you take you it so easy. Much. Go take some medicine and rest. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Talk thank to you, you soon. No problem. Bye-bye. Good night. Okay. Um, <clears throat> she's always a great guest to have, and I'm telling you, this is one of the always better Always a books. lot of topics. Yeah, this is one of the better books. I mean, we never even covered a portion of the stuff that she has in this book. You'll have to get it to read it. I mean, there's, there's castles and, uh, I mean, places all around the world, not just here in the United States. She has places listed everywhere. Um, I didn't even really know that there was a real, a really uh, Frankenstein castle and the yeah. history behind it, um, which was really interesting the way she had it. I mean, it was built, let's see if I've got it broke down in here. I'm pretty sure that I did. It was built in 948 BCE. Um, and I mean, that's how old that place was. And there was really a Frankenstein and uh, the things that he was doing, the people didn't like, so they stormed the castle one day, uh, killed him, and, and uh, tore the castle down. So, yeah. So just a hole is there. Mm -hmm. What I love about Marie's books is that they're extremely well-researched. Yes. Um, and she does not um, put a lot of conjecture in there, and a lot of it is, is strictly fact. And it, it's wonderful to be able to pick up somebody's book and not having to second guess where they got their information from. She is uh, extremely good. Hmm. I uh, think. Henry, are you still there? Yeah. Mo Mufi just oh. sent me a message. 
Oh, okay. And uh, she said that uh, she's been to that castle many times, uh, which would be interesting. And we'll have to hear from her and see what all she uh, has to say about that castle. That'd be interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how um, the the writers of that time picked very historical characters and twisted them. Uh, Frankenstein, uh, Dracula, um, that were all based on real characters um, and, and just turned into these lovely twisted horror stories. I like it. It's fun. Yes. Um, let me see if I've got some other places in here for Wait, I know that you uh, you have a story in there, Henry? Yes. Uh, as a matter of Let's fact. Let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think everybody's heard pretty much uh, all the ones that, that I've had in here. Let me see if I can find them real quick. Like, uh, And it wasn't just me. Uh, she had put out a request from uh, a lot of people if they had uh, stories, uh, places that they'd been to and had evidence to, uh, like, tell her story, and she would put it in the in the book, and she did. I think I got, like, uh, three stories in it. Um, yeah, I've got... Uh, I've wow. got a little section on uh, the Waverly Hill Sanatorium, uh, Hillview Manor, the David Stewart Farm, and the Bell Nursing Home. Um, the Bell Nursing Home's no longer there. You can't uh, investigate there anymore. Um, but it's no longer there, or it's just not available it's, anymore? Well, I don't know if they've tore it down. I know that uh, the fire department had bought it, and they're going to make it a fire station out of so whether the building itself is still there or not, I don't know. But uh, they did buy the place. And that's as much as I know Ow. about it. So, uh, yeah, so you, if, you, if you buy this book, you'll get to see four stories that, that I've wrote, little short stories. I didn't go into a whole lot like some of the other people who goes into the history of all the places. I didn't really do that. I just uh, kind of like said some of the things that actually happened when I was at those places. And uh, pretty interesting. Uh, so you'll, you'll have to get that. Uh, there's, they've got lighthouses, uh, a whole bunch of different lighthouses. They got uh, uh, haunted ships. Um, they got, she's got stuff in here I'd never heard of. Uh, the Moro Castle ship, which uh, was in 1934. I think, uh, I forget how many people died on that ship. Um, I believe it was 200 and, let's see, 25% <clears throat> of 549 on board died, which wow. was uh, 137 passengers and crew members. Uh, but, I mean... She has researched this to where there is a lot of, lot of great stuff in here. Um, there's they, some guy has a whole bunch of places in here that he put in about uh, Denver, haunted places in Denver. Uh, some people wrote about Gettysburg. Um, oh, and, and she had a big article in here about the Skinwalker Ranch. That was very, uh, very interesting. Ghosts and aliens. Oh, yeah. And uh, she told the history about everything there and, and what goes on. She talks about uh, uh, Point Pleasant and the Mothman. She has the stories on all that. Um, she's got one on here called uh, The Borderlands, which is a place in Colorado that uh, that area is supposed to be really haunted. Uh, and... She has a, a memorandum, office memorandum in here. It's supposed to be from the government. Uh, of course, some of the stuff was blacked out. But uh, an investigator for the uh, Air Force stated that they had recovered three saucer-shaped disks, uh, roughly 50 feet in diameter. And uh, each one had uh, three bodies in it, 
that was uh, maybe three foot tall, each one. So they supposedly is supposed to be real. In Colorado? Uh, that was, I believe, uh, let's see, uh, this is part of a 1950 memo filed by FBI Special Agent Guy Hoddle about the UFO sightings in Aztec, New Mexico. Uh, oh, okay. He describes the three UFOs about 50 feet in diameter uh, that had been recovered, each containing three aliens. And we had uh, we had somebody on the show who wrote a book about the Aztec. Crash. Yeah, the Aztec UFO incident, mm -hmm. yes. And we had them on the show, uh, which was very interesting. Um, they researched that book uh, very well also. Uh, she talks about the, the Bridgewater Triangle, uh, all kinds of stuff there, Yosemite uh, National Park, and she talks <laughs> You mean Yosemite? Yeah, <laughs> Yosemite. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, my glasses ain't working right now. And uh, she talks about the Alaska Triangle. Not familiar with that one. Yeah. Uh, I hadn't even heard of that one either. Uh, there's a place uh, in Southern California in Orange County known as the Black Star Canyon. Have you heard of that? Uh, no. Uh, interesting stories uh, in that. Uh, terrors of uh, Turnbull Canyon. Uh, all these are in California. It's in uh, Puente Hills. That's Southern California. Yeah. yeah. course uh, the mountains and stuff that's haunted uh, up toward northern California uh, she had a place uh, talking about poltergeist she had one uh, I guess uh, one in Scotland called the Suchi poltergeist uh, San Diego poltergeist the Macomb poltergeist and I guess somebody researched these places uh, and the people uh, about about the poltergeist so whether they are you know really real or not or you know I couldn't say because I've never seen one have you ever seen one Barbara poltergeist uh, yeah, no well I mean uh, that's pretty rare <laughs> yeah that's what I thought too so. I mean I don't know if, if what the definition they're using is if it's uh, just moving objects or removing objects, uh, but I've never seen either. Um, I, I, I think it's a relatively rare. Now, An actual ghost apparition is rare enough as it is. Do you think that subconsciously people can do things like that, not realize that, that they're causing those things to happen? Oh, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's possible. I mean, because there's telekinetics everywhere. I mean, there's Russian tapes of uh, their telekinesis projects. And probably the U.S. has them too, but, you know, we don't release any of that stuff. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that there are people that can do that um, and probably can. You know, I don't buy into the whole it's the 13-year-old girls theory, but... Um, I think anybody can become a, a telekinetic. You think anybody can? Yeah. Uh, I think you got to be able to use certain senses, and I, I'm not. Well, sure that... I mean, I'm you know studying martial arts, and you get the you watch videos of Taoist priests and um, martial artists, and the amount of energy are the the chi that they can produce they can pick up sticks that you know we could not pick up their strength level is high um, and I think that they can project energy when they strike so yeah I think people can become telekinetic so you think they can bend spoons and forks like that no anybody can bend a spoon you just grab both ends both and ends twist. and twist yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know I meant without touching. Yeah, is a ch question in the chat. No, I don't think anybody can see a poltergeist, 
I think it is just the activity that they see. I don't think they've ever seen um, a ghost pick up an object and actually hurl it. Yeah, they'd probably only see the object itself yeah. move. Which I don't even kind think I've weird. seen anything like that. Oh, I don't think anybody has. The only thing I remember seeing on film is from the first se or second season of Ghost Hunters in the armory uh, where the sound uh, uh, guy's equipment box uh, lifted up and hit him in the face. A and that's the only time I think I've ever seen anything on film um, related to that. Yeah. You know, that's. There is so many. I didn't realize that there was all these different types of uh, places. And a lot of them, well, I won't say they're real close to me. Uh, but there's a lot here in Ohio uh, that I didn't realize. And that uh, if I wanted to actually spend the time to travel and go look, I could probably find some of them. Uh, well, now that you're retired, Henry. Just because I'm retired doesn't mean I can do anything. <laughs> uh, oh, but let's see. Um, uh, she talks about a lot of stuff around Hollywood. Um, she talks about haunted theaters that are there. She talks about uh, cemeteries like the Forever Cemetery and who haunts them. Um, she talks about uh, the Hollywood sign, the story on that. Uh, let's see, uh, a whole bunch of different hotels uh, that are haunted around Hollywood. And she tells uh, the different spirits and stuff that the people see and, and the, the ones that are actually haunting the place. Uh, studios, Charlie Chaplin Studios, Stage 28, that's uh, haunted. Culver Studios, Paramount Picture Studio, um, all those are, are haunted. And she goes in detail of telling uh, who's supposed to be haunting them and some of the things that happens in those locations. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Hollywood Hotel, Hotel has uh, many ghosts from the past. Um, let's see. She talks about Orson Welles, Lon Chaney. Uh, George Reeves, the ones that, that died and the places where they lived or uh, where they worked. Uh, people, I guess, sees and hears things all the time from those different people. Rudolph Valentino, he, he haunts two or three different places, supposedly. Then she talks about uh, John Lennon, Liberace, Buddy Holly, and... and those types of stories and she lists because I was saying earlier about uh, Lady Gaga Sting Hillary Clinton Keno Reeves and Dan Aykroyd she goes in and tells the the stories of each one of those of the the things that they've seen so that, that's really interesting I don't know if she uh, yeah it's amazing how many celebrities actually have admitted that they've seen ghosts and not all of them lived in celebrity houses but she's absolutely right um, the majority of celebrities buy other celebrity houses uh, yes they they do. in LA anyway mm -hmm. but they also cost a lot of money <laughs> that's true yeah <laughs> and I'm not paying a lot of money just for a ghost <laughs> <laughs> no thank you uh, which, is, which is really interesting she talks about the uh, the story, I guess the area or the set where this happened at, uh, is supposed to be haunted. And she talks about the story uh, with Vic Morrow, who um, he was filming a movie, and mm -hmm. uh, he ended up... Uh, the Twilight Zone movie, yeah. Yeah, he ended up getting killed, and, and I guess the two kids that he had there uh, got killed too. Uh, they was filming with a helicopter. Yeah, that was very tragic. Mm-hmm. And so that she talks about that and uh, different things. She talks about uh, the serial killers and their ghosts, and she goes into great detail of from how things started with them 
the killings and how all that stuff took place and then, then what happened and where, where they're haunting at. She talks about uh, Ted Bundy. Uh, I guess it's Herb Baumeister and Dahmer and Jack uh, Uwiger. Have you ever heard of him? I don't recall ever that one. Yeah, well, that, like I say, then there's lots of interesting stuff still that you haven't heard. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, this this is an excellent, excellent little book. And uh, I recommend it to anybody. Uh, so, hopefully, uh, we'll see about uh, getting Barbara a book. How does that sound? I'm going to have to get one, yes. Yeah. So, you always get them on Kindle, though, don't you? Uh, normally, yeah. Um, save a tree. Um, but like I said, there are some books that you just can't read on a Kindle. Oh, well, true. Well, this this Because um, there's some things that, you know, the, the pages are shrinked. Oh, yeah. And you just cannot see photographs very well. It gets kind of grainy. So, this book, there's some books that you have to get as books. Well, this book has, like... 368 pages so it's it's a fairly good size book uh, but very very entertaining very interesting so we're down to like four minutes so you got something you want to talk about or uh no it's been it's actually been pretty quiet in the paranormal um and, you know, we're close, we're coming up on uh, October, which is the Halloween month. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see how many other stories come out and, and I what's have, happening in the paranormal field. I have two investigations next month, and uh, Mark sent me a message earlier today and was telling me that he's been contacted from a bar coffee shop in Cincinnati that they want somebody to come down and investigate. My first question was at two o'clock in the morning because we can't do it till after they close. And I said, that's probably not a good area. <laughs> yeah, but think of it this way. There's coffee on site. Well, I, <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> so he's getting more information to let me know. And if I end up doing something like that, I'm riding down with him. So, Good idea. Yes. I'm not going to try to drive the streets in Cincinnati. Yeah. <laughs> no way. I don't like... But that's a lot of investigations for one month, though. Uh, what well, he doesn't have a date set on, on that one. But the other two is one's Preble County, and the other one is going back over here to uh, Middletown. And uh, we did get quite a bit of stuff from, from there. And uh, we didn't get a do a full investigation last time I was there, so... Hopefully, we'll really get a bunch of stuff on that. Is there going to be the Halloween stroll again this year? I don't remember what town you go to for that. Oh, uh, no, that is in Dayton, and they either already had it or it's not until next year. Um, I wasn't invited oh. this time. Uh, of course, I haven't been invited the last couple of years, but uh, I've been in contact with some of them, so hopefully I can you know, kind of like get into it maybe next year and, and go to a location. I want to go to the, because they go through all these houses that people have set up and they tell the ghost stories. Uh, the people comes to the outside and the, the people who owns the home comes out on the porch and tells a story. But the last house that they go to, they always have the people come in and that's on the tour and they get uh, free hot cocoa and some kind of snacks or something. And hopefully I would like to be in that last home and be able to do my show and talk to some of the people who's been on the tour and see what they think, which which would be interesting. Yeah. See if anybody's seen anything. It'd be nice. Yep. Yep. All right. We're down well, to yeah. just about time to go. And uh, I do want to thank everybody for listening tonight, those in the chat room and those listening from around the world. And uh, we will... I guess uh, be back here next week, hopefully, if everything goes okay. 
and uh, <laughs> and then we uh, we will I will let you know who's going to be on. So during the week, I'll post it, and everybody will be able to know then. So with that, I guess it's just about time that we wrap up. And I want to tell everybody, uh, this is uh, Henry Foister. And Barbara Duncan. And we will see you next week at the same time. So good night, everybody. You've been listening to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of the Paranormal View.